So greetings and welcome. I am uh, Dr. Brad Ellison with uh, Ortho Carolina. I'm a hip and knee specialist. And over the past 14 years, I've been working with patients with knee arthritis and uh, offering them different non-operative options as well as uh, surgical options. So today we'd like to share some of our perspective and experience in caring for patients with knee arthritis. And uh, hopefully that will help provide some useful information for you in your journey for you or anyone you may know with this condition. So um, during my practice, I've had an opportunity to perform over about 4,000 joint or knee preservation and knee replacement procedures. And uh, this is usually uh, one of the treatments that we'll offer to some patients with knee arthritis. So hopefully this will serve as an expansion of your knowledge and familiarity with this condition and help you uh, understand knee arthritis in a better way. So first in, in talking about knee arthritis, I think it's important to understand what is knee arthritis. And essentially it's a wearing away of the surface of the cartilage in our knee joint. And hopefully you can see our picture here. We can show what a knee joint looks like. It's principally composed of bone, but there's two to three millimeters of cartilage which overlie the bone and provide a very smooth, frictionless surface, allow the knee to move and work properly. And it's the development of arthritis where we lose that cartilage surface, and it's a structural erosion where you lose that cartilage surface and that generates friction and pain and swelling and the dysfunction that we come to know as knee arthritis. Knee arthritis is a chronic progressive degenerative disease, meaning that once you have it, it typically worsens over time. There are many different causes for knee arthritis. One of the more common causes is osteoarthritis, or simply wear and tear arthritis. And this is just in our fifth and sixth decades of life, of many millions of cycles of walking and standing and stairs and sports and recreational activities can wear away that cartilage surface in our knee and that can lead to pain, swelling, and inflammation in knee arthritis. Other causes can lead to knee arthritis as well. Sometimes traumatic injuries. Some people may have sports injuries where a ligament may have been torn or cartilage may have been damaged. And that over time can lead to an accelerated wear of the cartilage in the knee and in turn arthritis. In some people, autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis can lead to a destruction and erosion of that cartilage in the knee. And again, knee arthritis can be the result. Other patients may develop other conditions like gout where crystals get deposited in the knee joint can generate a lot of inflammation and breakdown and degradation of the cartilage in the knee. Some patients have some malalignment conditions that can lead to either a bowed leg alignment or a knock knee leg alignment. And those altered stresses being transmitted through the knee can lead to erosion of the cartilage surface and again, can result in arthritis. And some patients may be at a higher risk for developing arthritis simply because it runs in their family with a higher genetic predisposition for developing knee arthritis. Now arthritis usually starts off as a mild condition or simply the cartilage can be worn in certain focal areas and then can move to other areas of the knee to become more moderate knee arthritis. And then the area of cartilage loss will increase in size and over time that can become more severe arthritis. There's even further cartilage loss. And again, the symptoms from mild to moderate to severe are usually associated with an increase in frequency of pain, swelling, and dysfunction. Patients with mild knee arthritis typically may have you know, an occasional sore knee that is flared up after some yard work or some recreational activity, but it may be relatively infrequent. The use of over-the-counter medicines and rest and ice, perhaps a knee sleeve, and just some time being less active can usually help that mild knee arthritis respond favorably and hopefully calm down any inflammation in the knee. However, once the mild knee arthritis progresses to more moderate knee arthritis, this can result in more frequent increase in pain, swelling, and dysfunction in the knee. Sometimes over-the-counter medicines may not be helpful enough and other activity modifications may not help. In these situations, some people will find themselves seeking the help of an orthopedic specialist. And these prescription medicines, injections, bracing therapy, other 
medically uh, advised treatments can be offered to kind of help manage moderate interference. And as we know that arthritis has a tendency to progress over time, moderate knee arthritis can become severe knee arthritis. And in these situations, we may find the increase in frequency and severity of the pain, swelling, and dysfunction from knee arthritis to be very disruptive. It may be very difficult just to stand or walk for short distances, getting around the house or walking to the mailbox may be very difficult. The knee may want to buckle or give way or present concerns for falling and instability. In these situations, non-operative treatments may not always be helpful. And working with a orthopedic and ortho Carolina specialist, sometimes surgery can help intervene and correct severe knee arthritis, provide a definitive treatment. Many questions focus on how can we reduce our risk for arthritis. And I think that's a very good question because all of us need to be focused on how to live a nice, healthy, long life and avoiding injuries to our needs. So avoiding the high impact, running, jumping, kicking, and high forceful activities that can result in a ligamentous or cartilage damage to the knee, which can beget a higher risk for developing knee arthritis. Trying to keep our weight down to an ideal body weight will reduce the amount of force that's transmitted across our knees will lead to reduce inflammation from knee arthritis. Trying to develop a healthy, low impact exercise program, it can be walking, biking, either a stationary or road bike, elliptical, treadmill, aquatics, tai chi, yoga, are all great activities to add into a regular low impact exercise program. To keep us fit, healthy and active, and work on our balance and strength and coordination. But sometimes as we age and get into our fifth and sixth decade of life, just the amount of activity that we participate in can put us at risk for developing arthritis. Just like we get gray hair and wrinkles, sometimes knee arthritis is a byproduct of aging and too many birthdays. But there are treatment for that and working with the ortho Carolina specialist can be a way to help understand what are the most appropriate treatments that can help you with knee arthritis. Self-directed treatments can sometimes be helpful too. We mentioned a few earlier. And so typically activity modifications can be useful where you try to limit the amount of standing, walking, and stair type activities. Sometimes using over-the-counter ibuprofen, naproxen, or diclofenac, either an oral medication or a topical treatment can be helpful. Again, using a healthy exercise program, keeping our weight down. Sometimes oral supplements can be helpful. Glucosamine and chondroitin are commonly available. Even some uh, indications that turmeric and ginger can be helpful in reducing inflammation from arthritis. Other diets that are focused on reducing inflammation can be very helpful as well, particularly trying to avoid fatty foods and red meat, and instead interject fruits and vegetables and fish as a source of protein can be helpful in reducing that fuel of inflammation that we can put into our bodies and then can cause the knee to flare up. Knee sleeves and supportive aids like canes and walkers can be helpful if the knee is starting to be unstable and buckling. And working with an orthopedic surgeon can be the next step. If the non-operative treatments that you've tried up to a certain point aren't all that helpful, then seeking out the expertise of an ortho Carolina specialist can really help you understand what the true problem is. Through that interaction, the surgeon will understand what your history of the problem is and what the details are leading to your condition perform a detailed exam and really understand kind of why the knee is having the pain and swelling and dysfunction that it's, de it's demonstrating. Imaging can be uh, helpful as long as it is appropriate to help identify if knee arthritis is the true problem causing that particular discomfort. And through that interaction, there can be a clear understanding as to what exactly is the problem. And if it is truly knee arthritis, then different specific treatment recommendations can be offered and initiate a treatment plan that can be very helpful in managing this condition. Through this encounter, certain prescription medicines can sometimes be very helpful in reducing the inflammation that we can encounter from knee arthritis. Physical therapy through a guided therapist can show some really good improvements in improving muscular balance and strength in dealing with a knee that's not structurally normal. Bracing can be helpful, as well as different types of injections. Commonly a cortisone or a steroid injection can be helpful and that serves to put a very potent anti-inflammatory medicine in a steroid inside the knee joint to really reduce the inflammation from the knee arthritis. Hyaluronic acid or these gel injections 
are designed to really insert themselves into a knee joint and reduce the friction that may be there from the arthritis. And this provides a better, more favorable buffer for the knee joint. Occasionally, platelet-rich protein, or PRP, has been shown in some studies to be helpful too in reducing pain, inflammation, and discomfort from knee arthritis. Outside of these treatments, other alternative treatments can also be considered. Um, different treatments can provide short-term and temporary improvements in uh, relief for the knee arthritis, but sometimes may not impact the overall progression of knee arthritis. Different treatments like lasers, massage, acupuncture, electro stimulation around the knee, electromagnetic uh, use around the knee, denervation treatments, and even stem cell injections. All may be helpful in some transient temporary relief, but very limited evidence is available to show that it alters the progression of the disease, provides any long-term improvement in the condition. And at some point, when all non-operative options have been explored and exhausted, and someone has severe knee arthritis that's causing really debilitating pain and dysfunction, surgery may be considered. Different surgical options can be explored with an Ortho Carolina specialist looking at joint preservation versus joint replacement. Joint preservation usually is focused on whether or not there may be a meniscus tear inside a mildly arthritic knee. As long as the arthritis is relatively minimal and there is a confirmed meniscus tear, the meniscus really serves as a shock absorber inside the knee. If there's a tear in the structure of the meniscus, it can move in and out of the knee in an unstable way and cause locking and mechanical symptoms. And those situations can be very problematic. So a joint preservation surgery would be something like in the arthroscopy where a camera can look inside the knee joint and then through another small poke hole, fix that torn cartilage segment. Now, as long as the arthritis is relatively mild or minimal, that can be a very constructive treatment for that particular However, if there is significant knee arthritis, and we know that the structure of the cartilage surface has been worn away, joint replacement may be a more appropriate surgical treatment. This can come in the form of a partial knee replacement or a total knee replacement. And this is dictated by the size and the location of the cartilage loss. The knee has three compartments, the inside compartment, the outside compartment, and the kneecap compartment. If the arthritis is isolated and localized to one of those compartments, then a partial knee replacement may be a perfectly suitable treatment. We think that this would be a lesser surgery, quicker recovery, and an appropriate way to treat arthritis confined to a single compartment. However, many times the arthritis is diffusely distributed throughout the knee, maybe in multiple compartments. In these situations, a total knee replacement is likely to be more successful and appropriate in those conditions. In recent years, there's been a lot of talk about different technological platforms and how they can be helpful in managing the technical aspect of the surgery and performing knee replacement. Some of these include robotic assisted surgery, computer navigation surgery, patient specific instrumentation or implants, augmented reality, or artificial intelligence. And while all are very exciting platforms with great potentials, it's unclear exactly today, in 2023, how each of these platforms can best serve knee replacement surgery. The evidence that's been accumulated so far has been rather limited. And we can see that all of these treatments provide additional costs to the knee replacement procedure. And the clinical benefit is yet to be clearly understood. So at Ortho Carolina, we are actively exploring these platforms. And there may be certain situations where they could be beneficial for patients undergoing surgery. So explore these at your encounters with your orthopedic specialist to see if this may be something that could be appropriate in your particular situation. Once a decision for surgery has been made by the physician and the patient, it's really a partnership to develop the best possible experience. It starts by optimizing a patient's health, by ensuring that we can understand all of their medical problems they may have to better undergo anesthesia, surgery, and recovery in a way that's gonna facilitate the best possible outcome. This will usually also be met with an educational session where you can meet with a therapist or a specialist 
We provide some 30 to hour long conferences of familiarization with what's involved with undergoing the anesthesia and the surgery and exercises that will be helpful in gaining your strength and motion back after surgery. It will also serve as an overview of which medications may be most appropriate to help you control your pain and be comfortable and be able to participate in a meaningful rehab program. There may be a discussion about outpatient surgery where you go home the same day compared to inpatient surgery you may stay overnight in a hospital facility. Outpatient surgery has a lot of advantages for those patients who are good candidates for outpatient surgery. It's usually dictated by having um, minimal health problems, meaning they can get home safely after an anesthesia, a relatively straightforward and not a complex procedure to undertake, and a good support structure at home to ensure they have all the proper help they need getting around safely. A post-operative plan is very important, and having the surgeon and the patient understanding who is going to be a part of that patient's care recovery team will be critical. So having two to three people being at home with that patient as they return home from their surgery will be very important. They can help with meal preparation, running errands, being sure that that person can get up safely and get around and avoid any injuries. A lot of concern about the expectations after knee surgery. The knee is a very sensitive part of our bodies. In the old days, if someone wanted to hurt somebody, they take out the knees and the knee. So we know that it can be a very uncomfortable procedure for the first few weeks after surgery. Great efforts have been taken by your ortho Carolina specialist to ensure that you have the best anesthesia and pain management program to ensure that you are as comfortable as possible. Everybody's a little different in which medicines work best for them. So great efforts are taken to ensure that we can hopefully provide you with the best medicines that can help during this recovery. The first three weeks are really met, best met by staying kind of in the home, not doing a lot of activities outside of the home protecting the incision, getting up and walking and doing a basic exercise program, getting good nutrition, protein and calories to heal up from the surgical wound, and being sure that you can do some basic activities, getting stronger day over day and week over week. After three weeks, venturing out of the home can be helpful, starting to drive again, short trips to the store, getting back to school and teaching, those kinds of things can be helpful at that time. By six weeks, most people are ready to get back to their work recreational activities and traveling even can be done at about six weeks after knee replacement. There's still more recovery to be done though. I mean, the, the full recovery for knee replacement can be six months to 12 months for some people depending on their problem and the specific type of knee surgery that they undergo. So it's important to maintain continuity with your treating surgeon in your recovery process to ensure that you're meeting the goals set aside for both of you as you recover. A lot of people wonder, what can I do after knee replacement? And I think the short answer is really a lot of activities and pretty much most activities you may be wanting to do. People can walk and hike, dance, get back to tennis, pickleball, golfing, going to the beach, doing yard work, flying and traveling. All those things are great activities to do with knee replacements. However, the knee replacement is a mechanical device and we try to discourage some patients from engaging in high impact repetitive activities like running, jumping, and kicking. Because again, those generate a lot of forces across the knee. It may result in injury or even kind of an accelerated wear of the knee replacement device. Overall, knee replacement can provide definitive treatment for knee arthritis. In most cases, it can provide a 90% improvement in pain, function, and quality of life. About 90% of knee replacements will last 10 years. 80% of knee replacements will last 20 years. A knee replacement will usually be a big improvement from a severely arthritic knee, but still a knee replacement is a mechanical device and will feel different than a normal or a natural knee. So in summary, knee arthritis is a very common problem. It will impact about one in four adults over the age of 50. It will be very important to understanding your different treatment options, both outside of medicine, as well as with a medicine or orthopedic specialist, to really understand what may be the most effective and appropriate treatments for your condition if this is a problem that affects you or someone you know. I would encourage you to contact your local Ortho Carolina specialist to get more information. Please feel free to review our website and explore information with some of the links that we'll provide in addition to this programming as well. Thank you for your time today, and we'll appreciate uh, the opportunity to answer any questions if, uh, if available. So that's a great question about, is there a BMI requirement for total knee replacement? 
And I think we've seen that um, while knee replacement surgery can be very helpful for all patients, whether uh, their BMIs are over 40 and have obesity or not, the concern we have is that when a patient's BMI is over 40, we have seen clearly that their risks for adverse events is increased, meaning that they can have a higher incidence of wound problems, infection, heart arrhythmias, stroke, blood clots, all of these horrible things that we don't want to see happen after knee surgery. And so the true goal is to get our BMI under 40, because we know by doing that, we can simply reduce those risks of adverse events quite significantly. And so there's a great campaign that's underway, not just here, but really across the United States to work on getting our BMI down, which is really a modifiable risk factor. It's not easy, but it is doable. It's just like quitting smoking or any other kind of uh, activity that we need to do that's not particularly healthy. We need to have a discipline program and working with your orthopedic surgeon on some appropriate uh, resources on nutrition and weight management can be very helpful and uh, certain resources can really go a long way to help get that weight down, not only ensure that you're successful with your knee replacement procedure, but also with other uh, aspects of your health that the BMI can have a negative impact on. Yeah, I think so the question deals with someone who has had a knee replacement several times and still has some stiffness in the knee itself and may have some other uh, neurological problems like sciatica. And so, I think this speaks to the fact that every patient is unique in terms of their medical comorbidities and their knee anatomy and their structural um, deficiencies or, or deformities in the knee, what the surgery was done. Hard to know exactly what that person's um, knee problem was and what their surgery was exactly because it sounds like it was maybe um, a little different than the average person with knee arthritis. But I think, you know, trying to work with a treating surgeon or perhaps, you know, different consultations with some fellowship trained knee, knee specialists that uh, work on revision knee surgery, uh, they can really try to understand through your, again, your history and your exam and your imaging and perhaps some even additional diagnostic studies where maybe they need to get fluid out of the knee or some other laboratory values to really understand, you know, if there's anything like an infection or fracture or scar tissue or malpositioning of the implants or loosening of the implants that can happen uh, in a knee replacement. So it's, um, in short, a very complex problem that needs to be worked through in a very diligent fashion to kind of examine all the different possible reasons for why that knee replacement was not successful and developing kind of an understanding as to kind of which is the, is the most common and, and likely cause for that. And if that needs additional treatment, whether it's medicine, therapy, or other interventions, um, would be something that would need to be discussed with a, uh, a revision knee specialist. Yeah, so it sounds like you know knee instability can be you know, caused by different sources. It can be a ligamentous disruption, it can be arthritis, it can be a structural anomaly. So I think this would be important to seek out an ortho Carolina evaluation, again, to kind of assess exactly when it's happening, to do an exam, to figure out what may be normal or abnormal through the knee evaluation. Imaging could be helpful here sometimes. X-rays supplemented with enhanced imaging like MRI can really provide a comprehensive structural assessment of the knee and what may be abnormal in this particular case. And once you kind of have a clear and established diagnosis as to what's causing the problem, then an effective treatment plan can be developed. And so that would be something that I think, you know, working with your ortho Carolina specialist would be kind of a part of that program. And then another question we got is, how do you select the manufacturer of the knee replacement? Yeah, that's a great question. I think so looking at how a particular knee replacement device is selected for patients undergoing knee replacements, I think it's, you know, we kind of use the analogy with cars a lot. There's a lot of different automobile manufacturers that are available, whether it's a BMW or a Mercedes or a Honda or a Toyota. Everybody has kind of personal preferences as to what they like or what they may not like. And there's about 20 to 25 different knee manufacturers in the United States that have FDA approved knee replacement devices. And uh, many of them work very well. Again, they're all FDA approved, so they pass certain safety kind of regulations and standards. And so each surgeon may have a certain level of familiarity with a certain implant. It may be something they've used for a long time or it may be having certain features that they like with their team and surgery that allows them to do the procedure to the best of their ability. So that's usually what kind of helps decide which knee replacement system or implant is selected 
is based upon that surgeon's familiarity with the team and the implant device and kind of what it can hopefully accomplish for a patient with knee arthritis that's needing knee replacement. So it sounds like they've had a traumatic injury to the patella tendon many years ago and now they've had structural erosion and severe arthritis in the knee. So they really have two problems at minimum and maybe even more than that. So again, you know, this is where that inpatient history is going to be very important to understand kind of what may have been done surgically to treat that or perhaps even non-operatively in terms of the patella tendon injury to really understand kind of which compartments have arthritis because that may have some impact if there's any other structural deformity, if there's any restrictions in motion because it may be a very stiff knee. And sometimes someone who's had a patella tendon injury <clears throat> and also may have knee arthritis may have a very stiff knee. And um, while that is a clinical problem that people can notice, a problem with their mobility getting out of chairs and stairs and cars, it can also surgically provide some technical challenges in terms of kind of getting into the knee safely and being able to address the patella as well as the rest of the knee when the surgical procedure is being undertaken to uh, address that, if that's kind of the case that um, is decided. So I think that that's, again, kind of working on, you know, understanding the limits of that particular case what may best be appropriate for that surgical treatment, if that's what's decided. Sometimes if it's bone on bone, some non-operative treatments could be explored, like we've mentioned in, in the webinar series today, but maybe they've been, they've been tried and they're not effective. If that's the case, maybe surgery is the next consideration, just building a good understanding as to what the problem is specifically and what limitations may be unique to this particular case, how that could impact the surgery will be important to discuss before surgery is undertaken. Not commonly. So I think the question that was raised, is this sciatica a, a common occurrence after knee replacement surgery? And I think, you know, it's kind of back to that old nursery rhyme, you know, backbone connected to the hip bone connected to the knee bone thing. So I think everything is indirectly related, meaning that if someone has some underlying back arthritis and they've had some sciatica in the past, and they go through a surgery where maybe they're not particularly mobile for a few weeks, um, maybe a deformity in the leg was corrected or adjusted with knee replacement surgery and that's altered how the, uh, the nerve kind of moves to the back of the thigh. <laughs> and um, that uh, may have some impact if someone's at a higher risk for uh, sciatica after knee replacement surgery. That may be kind of a predisposing factor that's kind of encountered after uh, knee replacement, but I don't think it's a a very common occurrence that we worry about counseling patients on on a routine basis. It's not one of the more common um, concerns we see after your placement, but it could happen. And it's just important to treat that, um, if that were to happen, uh, as it would need to be treated. It would be obviously a, a departure from the knee replacement program and focus more on back exercises and um, uh, core strengthening, perhaps uh, in imaging may be needed or medications to be helpful to reduce inflammation in the back. But that would be a part of uh, being sure that that's treated appropriately so they could get the best outcome from the knee replacement as well. Yeah, so the, the question is, are there any insurance limitations related to knee replacements, in this case specifically Medicare? Not uh, exactly. I think that insurance plans are, are kind of moving targets. And I think all of us wish we knew um, where every insurance plan would be, whether it's Medicare or other private insurers because it seems like it's a constantly shifting landscape. And one year, something may be approved, and next year, that treatment may be no longer available or approved. And so um, it's a constant moving target is the short answer. But in terms of the non-operative treatments, usually Medicare patients can receive medications and injections, sometimes braces, and physical therapy as non-operative treatment options. And usually if a patient needs knee replacement surgery and has Medicare as their insurance, Typically, that is covered, whether it's outpatient surgery or inpatient surgery. There has been a move to do most knee replacements on an outpatient basis. So there may be some increasing difficulty doing knee replacement surgery as an inpatient in the hospital. That's been some uh, scuttlebutt in, uh, in the, the world of healthcare recently. But that's still continuing to evolve. And the hope is that if a patient needs to have inpatient surgery, where it's knee replacement and they have Medicare, that can be done safely and effectively without any insurance coverage issues. Um, so I think the short answer is Medicare covers most of the basic treatments needed, whether it's non-operative or operative, but there may be some limitations. Like we found that using uh, cryo cuffs, which are a type of uh, ice-based cooling treatment after surgery, 
are not covered by Medicare. Um, some people have them through friends and families and relatives, and that can be a very effective way to reduce inflammation after surgery, but sometimes Medicare may not cover that particular treatment or other treatment cycle. Yeah, so another good question is someone's had a hip replacement on their left side, and it looks like they may also need a left knee replacement to, in the future. And um, you know, typically, you know, we kind of looked at some of the physiological recovery that, that is needed to, to recover from an anesthesia and from an elective hip or knee surgery. And usually by three months, most of your blood levels and protein markers and those kind of typical um, aspects of healing are complete, at least 90% complete, we think. To undergo another procedure and feel like you can get up and move and have good muscle mechanics and safety and stability from the hip surgery to undergo the knee surgery and be able to do what you need to do in the knee rehab and recovery to get the full benefit of that. Sometimes if we do surgery too soon, um, it may be uh, fraught with some different challenges or problems. You know, sometimes the blood counts can drop a little bit after surgery and we want times for those to recover. Um, as well as just being off pain medicines and being able to kind of walk relatively naturally without a limp or any other kind of major limitations. And so I think being sure that someone feels healthy and safe and mobile from one surgery before they embark upon another surgery is important. Yeah, so the question is about certain types of surgical approaches for the knee and sometimes there's something called a vastus sparing or a uh, midline approach or a medial peripatellar approach to the knee. And I think that, you know, through the evidence that we've looked at through some of the um, studies that have looked at these different approaches, is at the end of the day, um, these approaches provide relatively equivalent recovery and outcomes. And um, the medial peripatellar and the mid vastus or sub vastus approach to uh, performing the knee replacement um, has some subtle differences in mechanics. But for the most part, the incision and approach need to be done in a safe way that allow the, the surgeon to be able to access all of the knee joint. If it's a total knee replacement, or perhaps maybe this is a partial knee replacement, maybe the incision will be adjusted a little bit. But typically, the incision is designed to give the surgeon straightforward access to the disease and the deformity inside the knee joint, so that can be addressed and corrected appropriately. And the implants can be safely put in in the proper and most you know, best aligned way to ensure that that knee replacement is going to work properly. And so if the surgeon is more comfortable from a, a medial or inside incision versus an anterior based incision, that's probably based on surgical technique and comfort level. I don't think we've seen much evidence to suggest that one is more superior than another over the long term uh, in following patients after those two types of approaches for knee replacement. Yeah, so I think that's a good question about, you know, is there any detrimental effect to cortisone injections inside the knee or even gel injections inside the knee? And I think that, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, cortisone is an is a FDA-approved medication and uh, it can be safely injected into the knee. I think the main question really is, you know, does it provide relief? And once we kind of make the decision to offer someone a steroid injection, we understand that arthritis can be relatively severe in most cases. And so we try to say that about three or four injections a year are the maximum that a patient should undergo every three months is kind of how we try to space them out. Usually after the third or fourth injection, you have a good sense of whether or not that steroid is gonna provide any further relief in that case of knee arthritis. And if it does, I think it's probably okay to continue, but at some point we find that the injection really isn't able to provide much relief. It may only offer two or three weeks of relief. In those situations, it's probably not worth doing anymore. It's not so much that it damages the knee or makes the arthritis worse, it's just that it doesn't provide much benefit. Anytime we do an injection, there's always a very, very small risk that an infection can be taken from the outside world into the knee joint and cause an infection inside the knee joint. So I think we need to be clear in understanding that any treatment where we're trying to put an injection to the knee should be anticipated to, to produce a result of improved pain, swelling, and dysfunction for a month or more. If it's less than that, it's probably not worth doing. Um, the gel injections, we can only uh, do those about every six months, usually due to some insurance coverage and limitations. 
And the thought is that that's still an injection from the outside world into the knees. The same theoretical risk of infection is there. It may not be as um, deleterious to the microenvironment inside the, uh, the knee joint, but I don't think that if you're getting the third or fourth gel injection over three or four years, it's going to cause any detrimental impact on the, uh, the knee joint itself. But I think it's just really more designed to understand, is that treatment helpful in reducing the pain and inflammation of the knee arthritis? And if it is, it can be continued. If not, then other options should be explored. Yeah, great question looking at, you know, someone who has knee pain, is it from the meniscus that could be damaged or torn, or is it from something else, like a ligaments tear or knee arthritis? And that's a great question. I think that's what's really going to be important to get out of that orthopedic consultation. Because again, they'll kind of listen to the story of why that knee is having some trouble. And if it's more of mechanical symptoms. So if someone kind of plants their leg, pivots and twists, and they notice some buckling or pain, that could be a meniscus tear. It could also be arthritis. But I think that sorting out what's a mechanical pain, meaning it's kind of induced by maneuvering, versus what's a constitutional pain, meaning it's just there because you're at rest and you're just kind of you know, moving the knee very gently, that's kind of what can help separate what's a meniscus problem from what's knee arthritis. Again, supplementing that with a good exam, and good imaging studies can help really kind of lock that down in terms of understanding what the true principal problem is. And so I think that's important to understand if there is a meniscus problem that can be treated differently um, as we tried to share here today with a knee preservation treatment if it's causing mechanical problems where knee arthroscopy can be done, it's two small poke holes about the knee, a 30 minute procedure to improve that problem and about a three week recovery. But if arthritis is inside that knee, in addition to a meniscus tear, maybe fixing the meniscus isn't really going to help. And that arthritis is going to be the overriding problem inside the knee joint. And that's a conversation to have with the orthopedic consult to really decide what might be the best treatment going forward if there is a meniscus tear and moderate and severe arthritis. Because it could be that a knee replacement might be the single best treatment to address both problems in that knee. So a great question. I think, you know, we all kind of natural inclination is to preserve our joints for as long as possible. Um, and I think knee arthritis presents these kind of unique considerations, such in this particular case, where this question has been raised about are osteochondral allografts helpful in bone on bone arthritis in someone in their 40s? And is that the route that should be taken or should knee replacement be considered? And these are difficult challenges because I think we look at knee replacement as probably ideal for a patient in their 50s or older, uh, mainly due to some of the activity limitations because someone who's under 50 may be different in their activity profile versus someone who's over 50. And I think knee replacements were originally designed by you know, or for uh, rheumatoid patients that were stuck in wheelchairs, unable to get up and walk around. And so it really allowed them to get up and be mobile where they were otherwise wheelchair bound. And over the many you know, 40, 50 years since its inception, knee replacement has really been expanded to offer it to younger, more active patients because it's been a very successful treatment for a lot of patients with this problem. But again, younger, more active patients are more demanding and may use a knee in a different way than someone who's older. And so it may wear out the knee more um, earlier in, uh, in after surgery. It may cause some mechanical problems that, you know, a younger patient with knee replacement may not be as satisfied than someone who's older or maybe less demanding. So I think some of these considerations have to be kind of entertained for someone in this particular setting. I think that an osteochondral allograft has shown to be most successful when it's a relatively small focal defect in the knee. It's not diffusely throughout the rest of the knee and it's not associated with full thickness cartilage loss on both the femoral side and the tibial side. Age also has an impact. Patients under 40 usually do much better with osteochondral allografts and joint preservation than patients who are 40 or uh, in their 50s. So I think age has some impact on these treatments. In the end, sometimes a joint preservation may be helpful. It may accomplish certain goals in terms of improving pain and function, but it may be short-lived, meaning that in three or four years later, another surgery might be needed like knee replacement. And so I think all of these um, questions are great questions to have because it just demonstrates how unique 
knee arthritis can be for every patient that comes in and how it's not just a standard answer for everybody with this particular problem. But there are some cool technologies and cartilage grafting that can be considered for the right patient. And uh, we have several different ortho Carolina specialists who do an excellent job with osteochondral grafts. Sometimes though, that may not be the right answer. And knee replacement may be a more comprehensive and definitive surgical treatment that may get 15 to 20 year uh, survivorship and uh, benefit. And so I think just looking at that situation and examining it very closely to kind of help uh, provide guidance as to which path would be best taken would be probably the better way to handle that. So thank you again for joining the uh, Ortho Carolina webinar series. Uh, this is our November knee arthritis special edition. So hopefully we got a chance to share with you our perspective and answer some questions and provide some information that you might find useful. Uh, feel free to reach out and contact your Ortho Carolina offices or peruse the uh, website for some of the uh, content on knee arthritis and the links that we provided today to help outline some additional information on uh, different treatments that could be useful for you or someone you may know. And then also uh, the uh, plethora of other information that's helpful for other musculoskeletal conditions. So thank you very much for your time and consideration.